All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special live stream. I'd like to welcome back good friend of the channel, Kevin Hoser Miller. Hoser, it's been way too long since we had you on the channel. How have you been? Doing great, Mooch. Uh, great, great to see you and, uh, and, uh, and be on the channel again. Thank you. So last time we saw each other in person was in Reno back in early September. Um, and I only saw you briefly because you were uh, fighting with the old uh, malady that some of us get these days. And you disappeared and I didn't ever know what happened to you until we got back home. Uh, and you mentioned that you were hard down for the balance of that, that convention. But some of what we saw and heard out there informs this live stream. Um, and that's kind of where we have some proprietary information beyond this report. But let me review the bidding and talk about how we got to this place and, and the history of this particular mishap. So we remember back in late January of last year, 2022, there was, now I'd heard that the, there was this thing that had happened on Vincent and it was unclear what the nature of the mishap was. The, the first word was not that it had been a ramp strike. And then this cell phone video was released. So let me show that real quick and also ask the viewers to listen to the pitch of the engine as it, as it comes aboard. And we'll show this again as we're talking about uh, this pass. But here's the first thing uh, that, that hit the streets following this mishap. This is a uh, cell phone video taken from the fantail. So that, that's an eye opener. And obviously it was uh, apparent from that footage that the airplane had struck the, the round down, but that sort of, that view sort of undersold the, the, how, how dramatic and uh, catastrophic this, this ram strike was. So fast forward a few days after that was leaked, this footage was leaked. So let me run this. So the members of the crew who leaked that video were subsequently disciplined under the uh, UCMJ. And uh, obviously it, it didn't go very well for them. Um, so at that point, you, me, and our good friend Rowdy, who couldn't make it today, uh, convened a, uh, a, a live stream. Uh, this one was called, let me bring up the uh, thumbnail here. Uh, this one was called Another Video Leaked. Veteran Naval Aviators Analyzed the Results. And in that episode, uh, we endeavored not to get ahead of the mishap review process or the board. Uh, but we used our decades of, uh, of expertise, in your case, a Hornet pilot and a air wing landing signal officer. Uh, in my case, as safety officer in two squadrons and a guy who was on the staff of the Naval Safety Center for two years. Uh, and I've headed FENABs and, and been part of these, this process, unfortunately, more times than uh, I care to admit. Uh, Rowdy 
was the chief test pilot for the X-32, the airplane that lost to the X-35. Um, and so he knows about fifth gen and PLM and things like that. So we, we did some sort of trying to frame it. And among the things we stated at that time, because the initial word that hit the streets was the pilot was female. That was a bad rumor. It was not a female. It, 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 and so you, we'll, we'll show you that during the course of this. But we stated that explicitly uh, to try to quash that rumor right out of the gate. And then the rest was a waiting game because as naval aviation professionals, retired naval officers, Hoser's a captain, I'm a commander. Hoser was skipper of a, a Hornet squadron. It was CAG ops. Um, so we're like, yeah, we're not going to hang anybody out or get ahead of the process. There's no way we were going to do that. So meanwhile, we both have pretty substantial Rolodexes, let's say. So we were keeping in touch with some of the principles about where is this mishap report. In March, uh, I was told, and I'll use the passive voice on purpose here, I was told that until they recovered the wreckage from the bottom of the South China Sea, the clock for the board was not going to start. And so they did that at the beginning of March. And the reason they wanted to do that is there are three black boxes, not one, but three aboard the F-35. They needed all that data. And that data is contained in this report. So, okay, fair enough. Mishap happens in late January. Clock for the review, which normally would have started as soon as the board convenes and is due to the chop chain 30 days later. So, didn't happen. So two and a half months later, the clock starts. And as you can see, the daytime groups on both the original submission from the board and the endorsements fits a normal timeline. So as we'll see in some of these uh, reports here, the daytime group for the mishap report is early April of 2022. That's on track, right? Records recovered, start the clock, boom. The endorsements, so it's CAG, Strike Group, Airboss, which is to say AirPack. Those are signed out. In fact, Emma Weitzel, the Airboss, signs his out in August, early August of 2022. Meanwhile, um, in fact, this conversation happened to Hook. Like, hey, how are we looking? Um, no answer. And then more recently, I, I asked uh, one of the principals, uh, what, what's up? And the answer I gave what, was it's with the JAGs being redacted. So what we see here, what we came into possession of last night, uh, is the redacted JAG manual report. Okay, so there are you know, a number of different reports. One is the AMB report, which is not publicly available, has all kinds of detail, toxology reports, you know, song and verse. It's, it's really uh, kind of a TLDR thing for, for this audience. Um, and then in parallel, the Jagman lives. So the AMB is sort of a white hat report trying to, these finding of facts so it doesn't happen again and people don't make the same mistakes. We'll go over some of the recommendations from the endorsing chain in terms of going forward with the F-35C. And the Jagman is one where if, if there was malfeasance, misdeeds, uh, whatever, people can be punished under the UCMJ. Um, so just to spoiler alert, nobody's being punished here uh, in terms of UCMJ. Now we will talk about the characterization of the mishap pilot's flight status when we get to the end here. So that's kind of the high vis reviewing the bidding that got us to this point. So let me just set the scene a little bit more, and then I'll hand the floor to Hoser to go over the exact sort of uh, tick-tock of this mishap pilot pass. So this is the USS Carl Vinson, CBN-70. They were conducting the first ever deployment 
of the F-35C. The squadron was VFA-147, the Argonauts. And so this is the first, I mean, obviously the test has been done and so forth, but this is the first actual underway use of the F-35C. So the crews had been going on fine. They did a bunch of stuff toe-to-toe -to -toe with China in the Western Pacific. They did some dual carrier ops around Taiwan with Lincoln, the carrier that relieved them. And now they're on their way home. And so as Hoser and I know, when you're headed for home and your countdown calendar gets into the two digits, one digit, there's a sense of relief, accomplishment, joy, anticipation, returning home, um, and perhaps complacency slips in. So this was the last line period, the last at sea period they were going to have before they buttoned up the airplanes and transited back to San Diego. In fact, I was in San Diego when Vincent pulled back into port, uh, happened to be on the flight deck of the USS Midway, uh, recording uh, one of my episodes when Blue Angels flew over, Vincent pulled Pierce. It was a very beautiful day out there, and uh, I was happy to, to watch that great event. So, Hoser, let's, let's back up now. Day of the mishap. Talk us through what this pilot was doing uh, as he came into the break. Well, first of all, Mooch, it was a beautiful day. And, uh, you know, low scattered clouds, 10 miles of visibility, steady winds, steady seas. Uh, the pilot, all the pilots qualified to fly the airplanes. Everyone on the LSO platform was qualified. Everyone in the tower is qualified. Everyone on deck is qualified. Uh, routine day. Uh, this was a, uh, um, uh, the, the mishap pilot, uh, 370 hours in the F-35. That's a healthy amount of hours. That's a, that's a good amount of experience. Uh, certainly, um, if I can get away with the, using the word comfortable, uh, you know, but uh, certainly not, not a new guy, although considered a nugget, uh, for the cruise, you know, once you, you finish a cruise, then you're no longer a nugget. So, uh, but certainly toward the end of cruise, obviously a, a good pilot. Uh, top five nugget, top 10 air wing pilot as, 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 a, as a first cruise aviator. Impressive. Uh, 650 uh, total flight hours. So um, uh, obviously a, a solid citizen and, and flying the F-35 on, on deployment. Um, this was a large force exercise. I think a, a double or triple cycle. I believe they were, uh, you know, took off at around 1300 local and, uh, and they get back to the ship. Uh, after after 1600, a uh, couple of in-flight refuelings from from big wing tankers. So this is a a, a large force exercise joint, a uh, lot of fun. Uh, you know, defensive counter air is, is what I read. So they're 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 having fun doing that. The the mishap pilot is a combat wingman. Is not a qualified section leader. A section of two airplanes. So not not a qualified flight leader. However. Training never ends, of course, and on the way back to the ship, the flight lead gave the mishap pilot the lead, and this is for his training, to uh, you know to, to to lead a formation you know back into the into the break from the case one pattern. This is this is also routine, and uh, and so all all good here. Um, now now we're getting into the uh, uh, before the flight. Uh, in, in this report, we read that the pilot says, "Hey, I'm going to uh, attempt a." expedited recovery maneuver. And, and in the report, and it's in, in uh, paragraph 77 is what, where I read it, that uh, this is explained, what is an expedited recovery maneuver? And in, in the bottom it says, this is also known as a Sierra hotel break. Well, what's a Sierra hotel break? And, uh, and that's not explained. I, I, you know, what is a Sierra hotel break? Well, you know, to you and I, it's you come screaming back into the ship at the speed of heat and, and break at the stern for everything you got and, and, and get aboard. Now, um, I also remember a former CEO of mine saying that, uh, look, you, you know, if you're John Wayne in the break, you don't want to be Don Knotts in the groove. Now, I, I date myself from 40 years ago. There's probably more modern actors to, to use for that analogy, but I, I think it, it's still still valid. 
so so you know is this is this flat hatting and and I, i'm not sure you know you know and, and what is flat hatting to to the uninitiated well uh an example of flat hatting is flying inverted uh, under the golden gate bridge that would be an, an extreme example of it. and then you can you know varying shades from there um and so you, you kind of know it when you see it and so uh but but again the the uh this expedited recovery maneuver was was a thing it's it's in the report and with an explanation of it and 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 also when the report is a discussion from uh, I think it was the LSO that said, yeah, that, you know, it was, um, it, you know, it, it was something that, that we did. Um, so as we read the report, we see that he comes into the break and, uh, and I was uh, impressed that, that the JAG manual had the, uh, uh, the information from, you know, what we'll call the flight recorders, the black boxes at, uh, at, at 400 knots. And, uh, and and breaking at, at uh, before the round down, and, uh, and and at some point the 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 lead, which is now the missile pilot, you know, gets on on the uh, the tactical radio, the, the com two or the back radio, and says burner. So given given his wingman are warming, okay, let, let's let's go into burner now. And then then he breaks away and puts seven G's on the airplane, kind of lets off the turn, and uh, it comes out of burner now. And then puts another seven G. So to me, as I read that, instead of a, a graceful 180 degree energy bleeding turn to, to throw down your 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 gear, uh, it was kind of a square the corner, unload, square the corner again when you're a beam, and and now you're just you're just trying to slow down. And uh, and then in this report, it talks about uh, you know get, getting the getting the gear down and and not doing a proper landing checklist. Um, so you know the the landing checklist in the F thirty five is is uh, fairly straightforward. It's gear hook, um, the taxi light as desired, and uh, and then APC and DF, um, DFP engage. What is that? APC. So approach power compensator. So this is auto throttle is another another name for that, and then delta flight path. Delta flight path is, is similar, not the same, but, but similar to what we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, magic carpet or a precision landing mode. It is a, uh, it, it's not exactly that, but it's, it's similar. So it, it's a, it's a pirate pilot relief mechanism that the airplane has to help you steady on, on glide slope and, and fly a better pass, which is all good. Um, the, uh, the speed brake, in the F-35, uh, it is prohibited to be used uh, inside 10 seconds from landing. And this is, this is part of the report, which again was very thorough, very well done. Uh, the, uh, it, it says you know, that the, uh, the speed break was finally retracted 4.1 seconds prior to, uh, prior to impact. So, so well, well inside that window. Um, I do not know how the F-35 speed, speed break works. In the FA-18, uh, if my speed brake was out and I dropped my landing gear, the speed brake would automatically retract, but I could put it back out myself and hold it out on my own. And, and maybe there's something similar in this airplane, although I don't know. The, uh, the, the pilot is, uh, is at idle power now. He's slowing down. He he's, appears to be behind the airplane. Let's face it, uh, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, JAG manual report, uh, admits that the site picture was new and, and different and strange, and, uh, and then, then realizes, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to get waved off here. And uh, then finally, uh, as we saw in the videos, uh, you know, 2.5 seconds, something like that, uh, initiates uh, uh, max power to, to uh, because the airplane is now slowing and settling. And uh, the, the, the air wing LSO now is, is on the radio, of course. And we hear in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the videos, first it was power, wave off, wave off, wave off, you know, and this is, this is with uh, voice inflection big time. And, so let me, uh, Jose, then, let, me, let me play that video real quick. Sure. Uh, we have the split screen that we used uh, during our second live stream uh, to, to hammer home the point you just made. So uh, take a listen to that. So obviously 
uh, pretty extreme voice inflection. Uh, the other thing to, to note, because you, you mentioned uh, uh, APC and uh, DFP, right? Not PLM. So last time, uh, you know, many months ago when we were talking and folks, uh, we had a, a, a subject matter expert in the comments, I, I'm guessing a super hornet guy talking about PLM. Uh, so our, our understanding now is a result of both this mishap report, the Jagman, and talking to a, a guy who just left being an air wing commander is PLM is a super hornet term. You know, you also hear magic carpet. The specific term related to the F-35 is APC slash DFP. So among the things that the mishap pilot did as you said, he's behind the airplane. He's working off of fast. So he's he's short in the groove, working off this fast situation, idle. And you can hear that in the first video, the cell phone video. He's whisper jet until a couple of potatoes before the ramp strike where he has this come on to mill and then burner. But the critical move, the big mistake here was he thought he was in APC, that he had APC selected. And this just blows my mind in terms of being a legacy Tomcat guy where we barely had auto throttles, not to mention, you know, mode one capability, as we've discussed previously. But his reaction in a underpowered settling situation was to program aft side stick, which if APC was engaged would automatically advance the power. Okay, so APC is not engaged. So he gives it a smidge of aft stick. Nothing happens for, you know, a, a, a finite amount of time, but this mattered. And so by the time he has the come on, based on the voice inflection of paddles and his own realization, it's too little too late. And so this is where we had this conversation before, like, Okay, and again, we were using the term PLM. We're like, well, do you ever practice without PLM? And the answer was, you're never without PLM, right? We were in this <laughs> logic circle with particularly the, the SME in the comments section about, yeah, you, you never don't use PLM. And it turns out that is true. And in the F-35, it's even more so. You never don't use APC slash DFP. However, in this case, it's not naval aviator proof, right? Yes. And so there you go. And, and so, as you said, hits the ramp. There's some other detail in the Jagman about rails hooking wires and how it cartwheeled down the landing area. Um, I don't know if you have any specifics on, on, on those sorts of detail. I, I, not on that. No. Um, so but, as you can see from the, the side view, the pilot ejects about halfway down the landing area, winds up off the port side in, in the, uh, in the water. Um, meanwhile, and this is what we know because of conversations we had at hook, this is not in the Jagman. Um, and you can see, well, let me let me roll this because this shows you to your point how exhaustive these reports are, all the references, all the enclosures, you know, and you can see here they have toxicology reports of those who were hurt. And basically the three people hurt of the five worst were the pilot who ejected the mishap pilot the CAG LSO who was on the platform and a female deck hand who was manning the crash crew tractor. It was parked just outside of the starboard ladder line uh, on the, in the landing area. Okay. So um, the LSO, so when it hit the engine to cell came apart. So it hit nose first, which I didn't realize looking at the plat tape. Um, the first thing it hit was the nose gear, and that is is outlined in the mishap report. Um, but what, what hit and shattered was the nacelle and the turkey feathers 
at the aft end of the, of the engine and and both the wheels bounced off what hurt the female crew member was the starboard wheel and main mount what hurt the LSO was a piece of the engine shattered because these are all composite materials and hit him in the in the head and and he fell to the deck bleeding profusely in in excruciating pain and so the medical team was called to the platform responded and they applied direct pressure. They made a quick decision. Okay, can we treat him in the surgery room here? And the answer was no. We need to get him to the beach as soon as possible. So the closest trauma facility was the Philippines, 500 miles away. And their first idea was go to the V-22, guys, because remember, this is the air wing of the future. No more C-2s for CODs. They have the CMV-22, which is the Osprey COD. And they're like, hey, you guys can fly at 250, 275 knots. Can you take him? But the flight surgeon said, we need you to stay at wave top level. And, and they're like, we can't do that. We need to fly 100 feet or more. They're like, that's a problem. So the age 60 guys flew him at about 140 knots all the way to the Philippines. The medical crew who attended to him got air medals for their skill and saving that pilot's life. So I'm happy to report that the pilot's life was saved. Uh, he won't fly again, but he, I believe, is still on active duty and uh, will serve in another capacity. But the good news is he's alive and returned to his family safely. Um, so I know a lot of you have been asking about that. Um, the other thing that we found out at, at Hook so this is where Hook is a really cool event. Um, and it's this collection of people that in, in our case, you know, guys we haven't seen for a while, like me and Hoser, you know, uh, or the current guys out there serving. So I'm talking to Hill Goodspeed, who's the editor of Hook magazine. And he introduces me to this H60 guy. He goes, he was on Vincent. I'm like, oh, uh, that's awesome. Were you out there when the, uh, the ramp strike happened? He goes, yeah, I was airborne. I'm like, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I picked up the pilot. I mean, this is just a, a casual conversation we're having at Hook. And um, so that's how I ran to full ground that the pilot was not female. He is a male. Um, so, again, uh, we had heard that anecdotally before, but that was verified by this guy with just a, a conversation I had at Hook. Um, so and he said he was pretty, you know, he was alive and he had some some extremities that were that were injured uh as well so uh uh so let's go back to uh the the report hoser um so let, let's talk about some of the findings from this uh and, and you know as it gets endorsed cag strike group commander air boss will make recommendations i concur with this uh you know i i I, I want this done differently. I do not concur with this. It's very detailed. You know, it, it's, it's, it, this is why it takes a long time. Shouldn't take this long, but this is why it takes a long time uh, to come out. So let, let's start with what they call the bottom line finding, right? So um, I'll just read it to you. The mishap was a result of pilot error. The mishap pilot attempted an expedited recovery breaking overhead the carrier, an approved and common maneuver, so not a shit-hot break, not flat-hatting, as you've definitely described, Hoser, but the MP had never performed this maneuver before, and it reduced the amount of time to configure the aircraft and conduct landing checks. Um, okay, so just another point about landing checks as the old Tomcat guy here. Okay, so, uh, and I'm reminded of this as I'm flying DCS these days, so Tomcat, no surprise, had a lot of moving parts. So as we came into the break, you know, break, let's just say we're doing a nominal 350 knots, break a mile up when, okay, in the break, first part of the landing checklist was wings. Okay, so it's wings, gear, flaps, trim, fuel, AOA, harness locked, hook down, right? So that's, that's a lot of elements to a landing checklist. So when I read this, as you already described, it basically has three steps. 
Yes. Deer, hook, right? Taxi oh, light and, uh, and, and, and APC. And if you APC, uh, right, which was optional. DFP. Right, which was, was optional. And now, uh, as a function of this, it's not going to be optional anymore. So the air boss made this recommendation. Update the F-35 flight manual to reflect that Charlie pilots shall fly. Underlined words matter. APC DFP when recovering aboard the aircraft instead of as desired, which is what it currently says in the checklist step four. Step four of four. So that's a pretty tidy checklist, right, in terms of behind the airplane. But I'm just an old guy. Two, consult yeah. with the manufacturer of the F-35 to incorporate internal helmet-mounted display. So if you watched my episode with Paco describing how the helmet works, remember this airplane doesn't have a HUD. It has all the symbology in your visor. So incorporate internal HMD and or audio tone to alert the pilot that the aircraft has reached on-speed angle of attack and the power approach mode or in the power approach mode without PLM, or in this case, APC DFP engaged, all right? To ensure, uh, three, to ensure survivability of the upwind mobile fighter fighting vehicle and its ability to help respond to a crash in the landing area, position the vehicle away from the foul line, okay? So that's a lesson learned from the female crew member getting hurt. Um, then one last item that a lot of people are asking, what happened to the pilot? So this is the Airbus's endorsement. I've improved the results of the Field Naval Aviator Evaluation Board, which you'll hear us refer to as a FENAB for the mishap pilot and have taken appropriate administrative action where warranted. So what we know, this isn't, this is public information, but maybe some of you don't know. The pilot is allowed to keep his wings, but he is removed from a flight status. So the worst characterization you can have from a FENAB is you lose your wings and you are removed from a flight status. So this is next worst. I, I want to say, Hoser, this is an A2 characterization where keep your wings so you can wear it on your uniform, but you're never going to fly again. Uh, so um, what else is there in this that uh, pops up? A couple of, uh, you know, going back to the to the past, and, and maybe this is, a, this is a, a technique thing, but what I read in this, in this uh, report is that the, the the pilot must fly the airplane to a to a good start, and and, and engage these uh, th these modes. So the pilot's got to got to fly himself to a good start and then engage it. Um, and and so I, I think back to to when I would engage the the auto throttle in the F A eighteen. Understand it's a different airplane, but but maybe they're they're similar. Uh, our, our technique was, you know, to get yourself on speed or close to it and then engage it and not be at idle, not be in a, a military or burner when, when you engage that. Um, I, I'm going to I'm just going to guess that it's probably similar in, in, in all airplanes. Another thing is that that is as part of this training uh, to to lead a division, a, a, a mock division of four airplanes into the break. Um, what airspeed should you be? leading a division into the break of the ship at. And, uh, and, and my answer is uh, about 300 knots because the goal is for the lead airplane to break at the bow and then uh, everyone else times 17 seconds and the last dash four is gonna break at four miles. Now, sometimes this uh, um, you know, dash four might break at, uh, at five, five and a half, six. Uh, and and at that point, you come on the radio and you would say, uh, you know, last airplane breaking at four. Everyone knows you're beyond four. But uh, but it's, it's just a courtesy call for everyone else because there's another formation coming in behind you. So if you lead a division into the into the break at the speed of heat, 400 knots in this case, uh, you know that dash three and four are going to be well beyond four miles upwind when they break. And that's not preferred. And so so if, if that was the goal. To, to pretend to, to lead a division in, even though it's only two in, the, in this case, um, way too fast for that. And as you said, uh, behind the airplane basically is the way that that's the sum total of, of this circumstance. And when you're behind the airplane, uh, you forget checklist items or you make assumptions in close that in this case, you you're, have APC selected when you don't. Um, and that was that was a, a critical mistake. So goods, 
Crash Crew, as articulated by all the endorsements, performed remarkably. As you look at that that screenshot of uh, the second leak in one of the spaces on Vincent, you can see the hoses are soaking the landing area almost as that airplane hits the water. Um, so they reacted very quickly. The helicopter SAR crew did a wonderful job. The medical team, uh, well, whoever provide, provided direct pressure to uh, the LSO who was hurt immediately saved his life. And the decision to get them to the Philippines and the H-60 crew who applied their skill to do it fast, low, but safely. Also, this is the, the best among us in terms of talent and 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 you know shipmate acumen and and so that's that's all good um the bottom line from uh, the airbus's endorsement is the reason we do these reports is to make sure we do not repeat these mistakes and that we operate safely and in that spirit this is why hoser and i are are sort of teeing this up to a broader audience um you know, we love the profession. We were honored to serve for decades doing a job that we love, the kind of thing they make movies about. And uh, it was a gift. And we're not going to hazard either our professional standing or those still doing the job by talking out of school. So that's why we waited until this uh, Jagman was on the streets. Um, I will also say that we will put the link to the report in the episode description once we sign off. So if you want to review it uh, yourself, uh, you know, in, in the comfort of your living room, you can do so. So look for that. Um, Hoser, any last thoughts here before we, uh, we sign off? Yeah. Um, you know, have I come back to the ship at the speed of heat and Max performed the airplane at the stern? Yes. And, there, uh, did, did, but did I ever expect that, uh, that I'm going to get an automatic, uh, okay, grade? I, I never expected that. I, and it, so it was, it was on me and I had to, um, you know, come into the break any airspeed you want to, but you know, you've got to, you got to fly a solid pass. Um, we, we want our pilots to be aggressive and in, in the, in the, the novel, the, the, or I think it's a novel, the, the right stuff, I guess that's the right character, characterization. A narrative nonfiction novel, but uh, the, the right stuff, you know, Tom Wolf talks about this, you know, and, and, uh, you know, the, the guys that would go north of the Yalu river and engage with the MiGs, which was illegal, but, uh, you know, you wouldn't give a, a plug nickel to paraphrase for a pilot that, that doesn't show that kind of aggressiveness. So, but there's, there's a balance and, and you want aggressiveness looking good around the ship, looking sharp. Uh, but, you know, feeding that, that division inside four miles is an example, you know, hitting the, Hitting your Charlie time on time is, is an example of, of looking sharp and, and you get a reputation for doing that. Uh, you can max perform the airplane and, uh, you know, but who's your audience really? It, it might be a couple of the LSOs down there. No one else is watching you on deck. They're, they're, they're busy with, with, you know, whatever they're doing for, for the recovery. Um, what, what is impressive for the deck crew when you do a flyby, though, is when you, uh, you know, you have a division of airplanes doing a, a sharp flyby. And uh, again, the, the deck crew thinks it's the greatest thing they've ever seen. But what they really see is uh, those four airplanes that, that they helped put up there. And uh, maybe they can, you know, nod over to, to their buddies in the sister squadron and, and uh, say, you know, how did you guys do today? I mean, that's that's what what, what motivates them. So we we uh, we we want aggressiveness. But there's there's got to be again, there's that that fine line. And and, uh, you know, so don't be unaggressive. But uh, you gotta, you gotta fly the airplane. This is a mishap. It's a human endeavor. It's tough. What we'll learn from it. And again, uh, when this happens, this is what happens. These, this level of involvement, this, this level of investigation. Uh, if this mishap pilot had had gotten aboard safely, none of this would have been necessary, and he'd still be flying airplanes. Uh, so, as you say, Hoser, we want aggressiveness. We want to fight to win. We want to train like you fight. Uh, but there's a not so fine line between that desire and uh, getting behind the airplane and, and doing things that are out of your uh, skill range. 
Um, the last thing to put out that was a recommendation to your point, Hoser, about expedited, what are we calling this? Expedited recovery break? Expedited recovery maneuver. Uh, is th these are now illegal. Um, so they want folks to come into the break, 350 knots break no sooner than a mile upwind. So that becomes problematic as you're describing for division breaks. Uh, so maybe we're only coming in at sections. So that's going to be the rule um, until some time passes. So this is why we can't have nice things kind of a thing. Um, so I'm sure there's some grumbling about that, but that's, that's the ruling here. Um, so Hoser, always a pleasure to have you on the channel. I'm glad we got you back after too long. Let me remind everybody that Hoser is the author of the silver waterfall, which is a fictionalized history of Midway. We have him discussing that in a separate episode. I ask you to look out for that. He's also the guy behind the Raven one series of books and also the DCS campaign. If you're a DCS enthusiast and you haven't downloaded that, especially if you're a Hornet guy, uh, check it out. So thank you, my friend. Uh, I need to get down to Pensacola. We need to shoot an episode at the Naval Aviation Museum before too long. Let's plan on that. Uh, maybe post Easter time frame. Hey, thanks, Mooch. That sounds great. And uh, always uh, glad to be aboard with you. And uh, for everybody else, thanks for showing up. We have a great crowd here uh, today. Always uh, impressive to see that kind of a number show up for the live stream. Thanks for the lively discussion. I hope we answered most, if not all of your questions. Uh, if not, as soon as we hang up, uh, as it were, this will be an episode on the channel and the discussion can continue in the comments section. As I said, we'll stick the link to the Jagman, the redacted Jagman. It's got a lot of sort of black space, as you'll see. Uh, again, that was part of the delay to get it on the streets, but it is illustrative and it will sort of uh, fill in the blanks of what we've talked about here today. All right. So thanks again, Hoser. And uh, let me do my um, goodbye to the folks here. So as always, if you're not a subscriber, please become one so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using super thanks or become a patron at patreon.com. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.